So let's start with a very simple example. Let's go back to a ball metaphor. Let's say we have five balls. I've given you five different colors. Or you could just as well call them five letters A through E or give them any other names you care to. The semantics of the problem are of no interest to us. It is a numerical count that matters. Right? As I said, the semantics add color to the problem, but don't add to its logical content. So, I have five balls. How many different ways can we split these five balls, these five objects, into two groups? One subpopulation with two elements and another subpopulation with three elements. So, for example, let's say we pick our favorite peach, green and purple balls from this collection of five. Now here's one group of three. Notice that we have implicitly specified the remaining elements. The blue and the red balls are the ones which are in the other group. So it, it suffices already to specify one of the two subpopulations. The other is implicitly specified if you know the whole population. Now look at this particular subpopulation. Peach, green, purple. The order does not matter, but if we ordered them, we could specify them, say lexicographically, in six different ways. And here are these orderings. Now, the moral of the story is this. For every particular collection of three balls, there are six distinguished orderings creating ordered samples of these three balls. Now, the general principle then becomes much clearer. How do we go about doing this in general? Well, it'll be convenient to go ahead and abstract out the colors. The colors are nice, they're visually attractive, but then they get in the way of a formal appreciation of what's going on. Let's replace the balls by letters. And if we did that, then we have a setting where you replace the three balls and the particular arrangements by populations and ordered samples. So, you will get a subpopulation, A, C, D, corresponding to the green ball, the purple ball, and the peach colored ball. And the ordered sample on your left tells you all the arrangements of these three objects. At the high level, what we've got is one subpopulation of three elements to which we have six distinguished ordered samples. It is clear now that every subpopulation of three elements has a distinguished collection of six orderings in an ordered sample. And therefore, the number of different subpopulations you could engender multiplied by six, or more precisely in our context, three factorial, will give us all the possible ways of engendering a, an ordered sample of size three, where sampling is without replacement. Remember, inside a set, an object cannot be repeated. Now let's do this again. Every subpopulation of size 3 engenders an ordered, distinguished sample of six different possibilities. Therefore, the number of different ways in which you could engender a population, a subpopulation of size 3, if you multiply that number by 6, you must get all possible ways of specifying three distinct elements without repetition. Very good. If that is the case, then very simply, the number of distinguished subpopulations of size 3 from the population of size 5 is obtained first by looking at all possible ordered samples of size 3 without replacement. This in our notation is 5 to the 3 falling. And divide that by the repetition, this factor 6 or 3 factorial. Of course, this simplifies 5 times 4 times 3 divided by 6, and this is 10. But the actual answer is not particularly germane for our purposes. The logical idea behind the construction of the answer is what is relevant. Now, this is a slightly more complex object than what we've seen hitherto, but it's not very hard. It counts the total number of samples and divides by a repetition factor. This is the number of subpopulations we give this a special name. And this name is a famous name historically. It's called the binomial coefficient. We call this, in terminology, 5 choose 3. We represent it 
by writing a 5 on top, a 3 below, and enclose the whole in round brackets. That entire object on the left is called the binomial coefficient. Again, we say it in words 5, choose 3, and the terminology exposes the mechanism of what it is we are doing. There are five objects in the population and we are selecting three. Five, choose three. This is a famous historical object. In fact, this particular object was at the heart of Isaac Newton's discovery of the calculus, but more on that later. Right. Now, once we have this idea, this principle in mind, we should very quickly extrapolate, generalize, and come up with a general answer for this problem. So, let's go back now to a general, generic population of n elements. Again, let's say a1 through an, though what these objects are are not germane. You can, they could be balls, they could be colors, they could be numbers, they could be letters. It is immaterial. All that is material, that is germane, is that there are n distinguished elements in your population. From these, you wish to select a subpopulation of k elements. Remember, a subpopulation means that no element can be repeated. It is a set. How do we do this? Well, exactly the same way we did this before. Specify all ordered sequences, samples of size k, without replacement. That is going to give us n to the k falling. But then there's going to be an overcounting because of all these permutations of every particular uh, subpopulation. There are k factorial permutations. Divide by k factorial. And that exactly is going to be the number of ways in which you can select k objects out of n. n choose k. Just as in the case of the factorial, we would like to make provision for when one or more of the index terms are identically zero. So as a matter of convention, we say that n choose zero is identically one for all non-negative integers n. Again, this is a matter of convention and it smooths calculations as we move forward. It will be consistent with the analysis for when things are non-trivial. 